Good evening, everyone. Welcome to yet another blockbuster event at Stern. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Raghu Sundram. I'm the, the uh, dean of the Stern School of Business. Now, every time we have an event like this, I think of the bright side of being dean, which is that I have a reserved seat for me up front. <laughs> Today, unfortunately, I was reminded of the downside of being dean, which is I'm running to another meeting, and I'm going to miss what is sure to be a spectacular event. Um, I know that all of you have, have come to listen to our guest and not to me, so I'm going to keep my remarks short. Ten years ago, Airbnb, it's just ten years, ten years ago, Airbnb was three people and an idea. Today, even old fogies like me cannot imagine a world without Airbnb. I'm one of, uh, one of the biggest users, well, not biggest users, but I'm a frequent user of, 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 of it. <laughs> And you know, five years ago, when my daughter introduced me to Airbnb, I didn't even know what it was. I asked her, what, what exactly is it? And she, I've, I've rarely stayed at hotels since that, since that experience. Airbnb today, like Google, has become a verb. In that context, we are extraordinarily lucky to be joined today by Nate Blachasek, who is one of the co-founders of Airbnb, the chief strategic officer of, uh, strategy officer of Airbnb, and the chairman of Airbnb China. Nate is an alumnus of Harvard, and unlike some other prominent tech founders who went there, he actually stayed and completed his degree. He's really an alumnus. Um, Airbnb, as all of us know, is an incredibly prominent company in today's world. And as someone once said, with great power comes great responsibility. And that is, in fact, the topic of today's conversation on platform responsibility and global leadership. Now, on a serious note, this is a topic that at Stern we take extremely seriously. The, the study of the intersection of business, technology, entrepreneurship, innovation has been a major focus of what we've been doing at Stern over the last several years. But as important as the study of technology and innovation on, on, on business is the responsible practice of that business. As all of you who are students here know, we place a great deal of emphasis on multi-stakeholder thinking in everything that we do. For example, the social impact core in our, in our, in our um, undergraduate curriculum that all students are required to take. Nate will be joined today by my colleague, Arun Sundararajan. Arun also happens to be a student of mine, former student of mine. Um, uh, Arun is well known to all of you who are students here, and, uh, and even if you uh, probably are not. He quite literally wrote the book on the sharing economy. He's been studying the sharing economy longer than almost any other academic. And I look forward to a wonderful conversation. Arun, Nate, over to you. Okay. Thank, thank you so much, Raghu. <clears throat> thank you, Raghu. Um, thank you guys for being here. I'm uh, so delighted that uh, all of you are joining us. Um, thanks to the Fubon Center and Natalia for hosting this event. And, Kelly for your incredible event management, and thank you, Nate, for being here. Um, I'm, uh, I'm so delighted that you could join our Digital Leaders series. Um, you know, as you know, we were on this stage together six years ago, yeah. almost six years ago, at um, you know, the first sharing economy conference that NYU hosted, and <clears throat> it was making me think about how much has transpired in the last six years, right? I mean, certainly with Airbnb, but six years, I mean, nobody knew what an ICO was six years ago. Jet.com didn't exist six years ago. Um, you know, a perfect phone call was really a perfect phone call. You know, it was, um, you know, so, so much has changed anyway. But, uh, you know, I, I wanted to start off by, um, you know, getting a sense for, like, you know, what, what has the journey been like? You know, not, not just since 2014 when you were here, but you know, sort of since the start of Airbnb. I mean, like, you know, walk, walk us through it. I mean, from the early days to sort of having become the world leader in your category. It, it's obviously been an incredible journey. Um, I mean, for me in particular, I remember in that first year, 2008, when literally everyone laughed at us when we told us <coughs> what we were working on. I remember a mentor of ours saying, I hope that's not the only thing you're working on, right? And, you know, basically people would say, you know, how can you trust a stranger? Um, and they thought, well, you know, even if you could, this is not something they would do um, or that they could imagine there being a big market. Um, and so, you know, to fast forward 12 years and to see the incredible scale, 7 million properties, uh, more than half a billion guests served, um, you know, 2 to 4 million guests per night using the service, 
um, is re particularly remarkable for me uh, to think back um, because you know that feedback we got you know is still so real in my mind, yeah. uh, and, and then now it's happening at unimaginable scale. Um, you know, I mean, there's a lot I could say about the experience. I, I must say though, what's been most rewarding about the entire experience. Um, has just been the impact on, on real people uh, and uh, hearing individual stories. Um, for me, being able to travel the world, and you know, we are in um, 220 countries and territories, pretty much all of them, oh. um, 100,000 cities. <clears throat> so everywhere you go, I, I meet customers, guests and hosts, and I like to ask them, um, tell me what Airbnb means to you. It's an open-ended question, and I hear all kinds of answers. And um, you know, I'll share one of those stories. I mean, plenty of stories are around you know, how someone paid their mortgage or bootstrapped a company or something like that. Uh, but one story I really like, I was in India. And um, uh, a couple comes up to me and they're empty nesters. And they said, you know, um, when my daughter left the house um, and, and moved <coughs> away, I was very lonely and I was uh, even depressed. And my daughter recommended to me that I become a host on Airbnb to, to meet people. And she says, you know, over the last couple of years, I've met 300 people from around the world, and I call them friends at this point. I stay in touch oh. with them. And so she says, I'm not lonely anymore. Um, but she says, I want to tell you my favorite story about one of my friends. And she goes on to say that a couple from Canada uh, booked to stay with her over kind of the Christmas period. And she got really excited by this and was determined to throw kind of like a traditional kind of Christmas celebration, a dinner and um, you know, all the kind of festivities um, that she had, I guess, read about. Hmm. Um, and so they do that, they have a good time. The next day, the guest says to the host, do you know what happened last night? And the host is a little bit confused. She said, I, I think we had a good time, right? It was a great celebration. And, and the Canadian said, um, a, a Jew and a Hindu celebrated Christmas together. <laughs> and I love that story because it just shows um, how human uh, we all are all around the world, that there's a certain interest in just getting together um, at a very human level and, and celebrating and understanding. Um, and it doesn't really matter, really, what the occasion is. Uh, and, and Airbnb has connected so many people. So um, I guess those are the kind of the moments that fill me with, personally, a lot of satisfaction. I mean, obviously, the growth story has been incredible. Um, it has also been really interesting to grow the company into so many different countries, including places like China and Cuba. Um, it's been interesting to um, really grow our audience segments and start doing Airbnb for work. And uh, we ha now have a luxury segment. Uh, we uh, now have a hotel segment. I mean, there's all these new different categories of, um, of consumer and um, supply uh, that we have um, uh, basically grown into and started to specialize in, where you know, this has a humble origin of air beds. So you know, these are things that I couldn't have imagined 12 yeah. years ago. And then finally, you know, as we continue to innovate beyond just accommodation, thinking broadly about travel, we have an experiences product where we have 40,000 people around the world who have something it is that they're passionate or knowledgeable about. It could be cooking, uh, making dumplings or whatever, and, and they, they offer small scale experiences. And they do incredibly well. Um, and so it's been really fun for me to be able to continue to innovate and kind of create new categories even after we have created that you know, first category of accommodation so successfully. Um, and so, you know, the journey continues. I still think it's early days for what's possible. Yeah, and I, I love the story about the connection because uh, one of the things that did strike me early on in the sharing economy was this quest for connection. You know, you could, you could connect with someone, like whether it was in the backseat of a car and on blah, blah car or hosting them on Airbnb, sort of in, in, in the context of fulfilling an economic need. It wasn't like, you know, go off and connect with people, but this connection was forming, and you sort of realize that people really sort of yearn for connection in this technology. And it's one age. of the things that gave us so much confidence in the early days, when everyone was telling us, like, why are you doing this, and how's it ever going to work? The fact that, you know, we were the original customers when we hosted three designers in our apartment, and we had that firsthand experience, and then the fact that every subsequent experience that people had, we were, you know, always interviewing them and asking them what was it like. And so we really felt like we understood something that nobody else did at the time, and it gave us enough confidence to persevere. Yeah. Um, I'm going to pause for a sec, actually, and just, I forgot to tell people about asking questions. So in about 20 to 30 minutes, we'll take audience questions. Um, you can either write the questions down on these little cards that you picked up on your way in, 
or you can go to this website, pigeonhole.at, enter Airbnb NYU, um, type in your question. Um, if you aim your camera at the QR code, um, well, I guess, you know, guys know how to use QR codes. I don't have to sort of give you a lesson on that. Um, uh, and so, like, you know, keep the questions coming as we're talking, and we'll sort of get to that in a few minutes. So, um, you know, I'm, to, to, to me, Nate, uh, you know, I think one of the things that people don't realize at first glance is how incredibly complicated it is to make even the simplest version of what you guys have created work at scale. You know, this is very different from a digital advertising company or from a messaging app where you've got to convince strangers to let strangers into their homes. You've got to convince strangers to, you know, um, stay in strangers' homes. And, you know, I mean, it, it, it's always seemed to me that, you know, of course, as our students know, solving a real market need that is really hard is part of building, like, you know, sort of a massively successful company. But um, what do you think? made you guys succeed? I mean, what did you guys do right? I mean, I think f from the earliest days, there's maybe two critical things that, that worked out well for us. I mean, one was the team. Um, and so there's three of us. Um, my two partners are designers. I'm an engineer. And so there's always been this marriage of art and science. And I actually think the art and the design played a big role in us cracking um, the second piece of it, which was the uh, um, trust the innovation around trust. But one more thing I'll say about my co-founders is, you know, yeah, we're each very unique. Um, if I were to put a couple words to each of us, you know, Brian is the bold visionary that is always thinking 10x and like really pushing you outside your comfort zone and challenging you. Um, you know, much to me, the engineer's chagrin. Uh, but uh, you know, ultimately making us achieve things that we never thought were possible. Uh, Joe is, um, you know, incredibly empathetic and, you know, really, uh, dives deep into understanding the user and the user experience and journey. Um, and then, you know, myself as an engineer, I'm very good at, you know, breaking down a problem into a logical set of steps and priorities and, 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 and working through these things. And I think, you know, to start a company requires so many different skills. And I think it was, we are so fortunate to f find such a complementary skill set. Um, and, you know, sometimes that actually put us at odds with each other, right? Because we'd have different points of view on how to go about doing something and what was important and most important. Um, but we very early on realized that if we, you know, uh, debated uh, our points of view and reached compromise, that those, that middle ground was always a better solution than any one of us could have come up with. And so we developed a real, you know, respect and trust um, and approach to, you know, taking our differences and turning that into a real strength. Yeah, and that, uh, that really does seem to be, um, you know, because we're, we're in an age where a lot of the start, you know, a lot of tech startups have this sort of like, you know, one sort of bright shining founder, sort of like, you know, of almost sort of like, you know, who assumes this sort of greater than life mythical sort of um, like, you know, sort of front to the company and like, you know, that balance that you mentioned really does seem like, you know, a better, a better path forward. Yeah, and I'd say, you know, nobody is perfect. <clears throat> and we all have our blind spots. And yeah. I think by having three founders with very different um, personalities and backgrounds, um, has helped us to kind of cover all our bases, avoid blind spots. So I'd say that's the first piece. The second piece is, you know, innovating around trust. And, you know, in the early days, that was really three things. That was one, having what we called real profiles, because this was still in the era of, you know, frankly, MySpace and Craigslist, where you like, didn't really know who the other person was on the internet. Um, you know, Facebook had just come along and introduced the concept of like, you know, real names and real identity. Yeah. And so, you know, we, we put a lot of emphasis on building out a profile of the person, their picture, what do they do, why are they coming. Um, two, handling the payments. Uh, all of the other services around vacation rentals at the time were really listing services, classified sites. Um, and they didn't facilitate the transaction. And there was a lot of scams that would occur as a result. So we figured if we facilitate the money, if the guest pays Airbnb and Airbnb pays the host, and if Airbnb is able to return the money if anything goes wrong, um, that would solve a lot of common trust issues. And then the third part was the reviews, that after each day, the guest will review the host, the host re will review the guest, and each party will build reputation over time. Um, and that will promote, you know, um, um, clear, um, clear kind of expectation setting, yeah. uh, an unbiased kind of perspective on what's being offered. So I think you know that was the original <clears throat> innovation. Obviously, we, around trust, we've obviously added a lot over time. 
um, you know, uh, guarantees um, and machine learning and all this stuff that came later. But you know, I think at the very beginning, the common feedback from everybody was, you know, how do you trust a stranger? And the original formula is really those three things. And I don't think we would have come up with those three things and designed it in the right way without kind of that design thinking being applied. Okay. Was it reactive in that, like, were the things that happened that made you want to sort of react and then change how you did things? Yeah, it, it was absolutely an iterative process. It's not like we came up with that on day one. Actually, you know, the funny story is um, an earlier iteration of the site that predates what you see today was more like a classified site. And famously, uh, Brian was used the service to go to Austin, and, and the host picked him up at the airport and uh, had made him dinner and set the airbed up with a chocolate on the pillow, put a lot of effort <coughs> in it. And, and so back then, it was a classified site. We didn't handle the money. And so at the end of the night, that, that the host asked Brian, uh, do, you have, do you have the money? And, and mm -hmm. Brian said, oh, you know, I, um, I didn't go to, uh, can I bring it to you tomorrow? Um, and the host said, yeah, no problem, of course. So the next night, the host asked Brian again, uh, do you have the money? <laughs> and, and Brian had forgotten to go to the ATM. And suddenly things got really awkward. Something like a New York story here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, we were airbedandbreakfast.com at the yeah. time, and like, it's a strange concept, and this guy from the internet shows up in your, your living room, and it's like conveniently forgetting to pay you. Mm -hmm. So it became super awkward. And well, anyways, afterwards, we were reflecting on that experience. And we thought, how much better would it be just to handle the money up front? and have certainty around that, it would lead to better hospitality. Yeah. So some people think we have a payment system because it led to a business model. But actually the payment system was in response to solving a user experience problem. And it just so happened as a side effect created an easy you know, monetization uh, mechanism as well. Yeah, I mean like you know, trust is sort of central to a lot of the conversation around platforms and I wanna come back to this sort of a little later in the conversation but you know I'm, you know, I, I still remember the first time I visited Airbnb back in 2012. You guys were still, I think, 99 Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. You still hadn't yeah. moved to, 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 to your new headquarters. And, you know, there was a family tree on the wall that had, like, you know, pictures of all the employees. And, you know, um, so th there was, you know, the, the cereal, the famous cereal boxes. And, and still so, have the, them. So, so there was all of that startup y stuff. But, you know, in, in many ways, even at that point, you guys felt like a Fortune 500 company. It was very different from every other sharing economy, non-sharing economy startup I was visiting. There was, like, I remember a discussion about the foundation that you would create in the future, about redesigning cities. And this was, like, you know, you were still relatively small. Um, there was a very adult feel, like, you know, sort of none of that move fast and break things Mm -hmm. kind of thing. It was very much a, like, you know, we're going to create something big and great and, like, you know, let's behave like it. And so um, I'm, I'm wondering where this maturity and thoughtfulness came from. Like, how did you guys grow up so fast? Um, a couple things. One, from the very beginning, we had this, this value that we called every frame matters. And frame really referred to frames in the user journey experience. And it was actually inspired by... Um, and Brian was reading uh, the, I think, biography on uh, Walt Disney. And he read how that, uh, to create Snow White, which is the first um, feature-length animated film, you know, the first film that was more than, say, 10 minutes that was animated, they had to innovate all this technology and, and ways of doing things. And one of the things they came up with was the storyboard, where they like, you know, uh, put up key frames of the story and then built out around those things. Mm -hmm. So you know, we read that and said, well, we should make a storyboard for uh, the guest journey, the host journey, and identify kind of the key moments. And, and then you know, make sure we have teams focused on optimizing those things. So like, you know, how do you first hear about Airbnb to like, what we call the moment of truth when you open the door? And you know, is it what you expected or not? You know, we, we basically framed, identified these key moments and then you know, put a team around it to think about how to make those moments better. Um, I guess that's a long way of saying every frame matters, you know, really meant think holistically yeah. about the experience beyond just what's on the website, but the entire customer journey. And frankly, not just that, but everything about the company um, from the design of the offices. Um, if you've ever been there, you'll know they're quite unique and we've actually recreated listings. All our conference rooms are basically listings from our website that we recreated inside the <coughs> conference room. So they're all, you know, quite interesting. Um, to the company culture. I mean, before we even hired our first employee, we did a month-long exercise to define what our culture was going to be. Wow. Because I guess 
one, we were thinking very holistically about our business and who we wanted to become, but we also had this mindset of like, you, you know, we are all working on this under the assumption it's gonna be successful. Yeah. And if we're gonna be successful, and if we're gonna be, you know, like Apple or Facebook or Amazon, and I mean, those were wild dreams at the time, but like, I guess we always did something, did this with a seriousness that that is a real possibility. And so if, if, if that's whom we're aspiring to be, like what should we be doing now? Um, and w when doing that, we also like often identified companies who are best at that thing. So in the example of culture, at the time Zappos, the company that was later acquired by Amazon, was really famous for having a unique corporate culture. And so we went to Zappos and through uh, our investor connections, got a tour and learned a lot about how, how did they create culture. Um, and so we were often thinking like holistically and then who's, who's best at this one thing that we want to do and trying to learn, have this kind of growth mindset. The, the final thing I'll say is, um, you know, we've been tested quite a lot over the years, even from the early days. Um, you know, particularly 2011 was a, a, a tough year in the sense that, um, well, on the positive side, we were able to raise a lot of money. We raised $100 million at a one point three billion dollar valuation. But that was also the year that we faced extreme competition in Europe and suddenly had to kind of really go on the offensive and open up six offices within the span of three months and um, really hustle in a way that goes above and beyond what we were already doing. I mean, we had been taking a kind of more organic product focused approach and suddenly it was about like feet on the ground in other countries. Yeah, yeah. Um, to, you know, that summer we had our first major trust and safety incident that generated a lot of publicity and where we, you know, there's really a crisis of confidence around the company uh, and whether you actually can trust strangers and how do you do that responsibly. And, you know, in response to that, um, we stopped everything going on and we, we brainstormed uh, 40 new features relating to trust and safety and, and built them in the span of two weeks using our 200 employees. Um, and, you know, basically went above and beyond what even our critics were expecting us to do. And so, you know, I think through some of these struggles um, that were pretty intense at the time, you know, we ultimately emerged much stronger um, and, uh, you know, has led us to, I think, you know, be more thoughtful um, about these yeah. things. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that thoughtfulness comes, it's, 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 it sort of seems so important at this time because, I mean, the, the description that you give is so uncommon among like, you know, sort of high-tech startups who will grow to 100 people before thinking about culture. And, 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 and so it's, uh, it's, it's really, I, I didn't know that about you guys, and that's, that's, that's a really interesting sort of lesson in general for founders about, like, you know, sort of defining the imprint of what you want to be and investing a whole bunch of time in that rather than just saying, well, growth at all costs. Yeah, and that, that value of every frame matter, I mean, it really kind of came out of some design thinking ideas, yeah. right? So again, you know, some of that early team DNA caused us to think different about how we approach problems, think more broadly. Um, and, you know, ultimately we then, you know, uh, learned, uh, we tried to learn from the best and then apply that to our business and struggle through the crises that arose along the way. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, it seems like a natural path in like, you know, in sort of retrospect now from there to, because I've, I've, I've been reading um, I've been reading about your conception of the 21st century company, and I think, uh, like, you know, some of us at, at NYU and at Stern in particular have been reading about it with particular interest because, you know, we've always placed um, sort of multi-stakeholder responsibility and uh, paying attention to the social impact of business at the center of our education program. Our undergrads take, like, four required courses sort of around this topic and like, you know, our proximity to Wall Street probably helps, right? I mean, but, um, you know, in, in, in many ways, when I think about the responsibility of tech platforms now, it feels like this impact on stakeholders other than shareholders, impact on society, impact on the world at large, can be bigger and can be sort of more profound than the impact banks had or that the energy companies had or that the auto companies had in the past. So, um, and, and it's coming at a time where, you know, you guys or, you know, sort of other platforms like Facebook are still so young. It's not like you're 50 years in and now you're sort of thinking about impact. So, 
So what's your conception? Like, you know, how, how are you taking all of this into your conception of the 21st century company? I mean, what, what principles are you basing your continued, continued growth on? Yeah, well, I think there's really two things that have uh, drove us to uh, really formalize our thinking around this. One is, you know, every year for the past at least five, six years, as part of like making an annual plan, um, we would always write down, you know, what are the impacts that we want to have on the world, like long term, like 50 years from now, 100 years from now, like what do we want to be remembered for? And we'd write things like, we want to create millions of entrepreneurs, or we want to create billions of like friendships, or you know, things like that. And you know, I think those were, those were things that kind of appealed to us and we thought were good things. And it, but it kind of ended there. And every year, we'd kind of look back at past plans, be like, yeah, like, we still believe that. But it was really hard to measure. Are we making progress against these impacts that we want to have? So there was kind of that that go, goes back many years. The second thing that's happened is, you know, I would say with respect to tech, you know, we've been at this for 12 years. I mean, I think back in 2010, 2012, like, tech was a source of like all things good. It was like, yeah. you know, really cool innovation, and you know, folks were doing a lot of, you know, being thought leaders in a lot of different ways, and you know, there wasn't really any negativity around tech, and obviously that has changed so much. And you know, part of that I think is as you know, these companies have uh, become bigger, they intersect with the real world in much more real ways. Yeah. And you know, there are, like any complex ecosystem, many different um, interactions and even unintended consequences. And I think that's what folks are waking up to. Um, and, and it's interesting, as an entrepreneur, I mean, I think most entrepreneurs are pretty optimistic, right? And they get into this thinking, you know, I'm excited about technology. I want to build something and, and do something good. Um, and so I think you know, a lot of entrepreneurs aspire to do good things, but you know, as you become a bigger company um, and you have thousands of employees, each with their own goals, like it's very easy to become very narrow in your thinking um, and lose sight of maybe some of the unintended consequences of, of what's going on. So you know, we've been you know, reading all the same things you've been reading about um, and, and reflecting on that too. Um, so what we've said recently is that in our world, we think there's five stakeholders. There are guests, there are hosts, there are employees, there are the communities in which we operate, um, and, uh, and there's shareholders. And we feel a duty to serve the interests of all five. So we, we don't exist as a corporation just to serve the interests of the shareholders. Uh, we, we, we want to serve all five. Um, so that's a nice idea. What does that really mean? So we took it a step further, and for each of those stakeholders, we identified you know, two to three principles. Um, things like, you know, we feel accountable to the safety of our guests. Um, you know, we want to promote diversity in our workforce. Things like this. Um, but we didn't stop there. For each of those principles, we've come up with one to three metrics to quantify our progress. Um, so that very objectively, we can understand each year, are we getting better or not? Um, and as part of that, two things happen. One, you know, we're a company of 6,000 employees. And so you know, two levels down, you know, someone has a goal, and they're very focused on their goal. Yeah. And they're maybe not thinking about all the things that I might be thinking about. But how do you empower them to make the right decision? The idea is that this is a framework that any employee can use to think about, OK, I have my goal. But as I think about solving for this goal, Let's also think about how it impacts these other things that the company has identified. So it gives them a framework for thinking about the impacts they're having in their decisions. The second thing is we've made sure that every team is doing some work to drive one of the goals. And because every team has signed up for something, all the goals are covered. And so we expect to be able to positively move each of these uh, metrics and each of these principles um, and, and, and drive benefit for all, all five stakeholders. So, that's kind of the analytical like rigor of it all, which I don't, I haven't seen <clears throat> exist elsewhere. Um, and then to create accountability um, at the board level, we've created a uh, stakeholder committee uh, that will, you know, every quarter kind of audit the progress, um, as well as made uh, everyone's bonus uh, partly contingent uh, on our meeting our our stakeholder goals. Um, and then every year we plan to have a stakeholder day. So not just a shareholder day, but a stakeholder day, where you know, all five stakeholders are invited to participate. We report out our progress. We listen to concerns, ideas, um, and, and really make it a, a rich conversation. 
Um, so those are some of our ideas recently um, to, to um, you know, recognize that our long-term success is completely dependent on the success of all our stakeholders. You know, in the short term, maybe you can get by optimizing for shareholders. But if you want to build a long-term, um, you know, maximally successful company, I s strongly believe that you have to do well by all the folks in the ecosystem. Um, and so, you know, frankly, I think what's best for shareholders in the long term is, is, is being mindful of all the impacts on all the stakeholders. Um, and so, you know, I, I do think these things, ideas reconcile, yeah. but it's with a very long-term uh, view. Uh, I, I agree completely. I mean, you've got to, you know, like the, the, the sort of balance is really what leads to sort of success over a period of decades rather than sort of looking at like, you know, quarterly earnings. And it's, it's, it really is a remarkable vision. It's the sort of the kind of capitalism that we do want to nurture. You know, we've, there's been a discussion about like, you know, are we nurturing the right kind of capitalism? And this really does sound like the right kind. And, you know, I feel like I know you guys well enough as a company to know it's not just a sound bite that like, you know, it's actually, it's, it's real and it's sort of where you've been heading. Um, you know, there, there, there are trade-offs, I guess, and I, I'll, I'll, maybe we'll get to them in the Q&A about like, you know, sort of like, you know, how do you balance the interests of the different stakeholders? Speaking of the q and I mean, if you're writing down your questions on the little cards, this may be a good point for the volunteers to start to collect some of those questions so that we can weave them into the Q&A later on. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, I'm, uh, I, I, I want to turn to the other piece of, um, of, of like, you know, what, what, we, what we decided to talk about today, right? I mean, which is the global leadership. Um, you know, you guys are a worldwide phenomenon. And, um, you know, you're, th th there's very little doubt about your global leadership. And it is unique in many ways. Um, <clears throat> you know, because I can't think of another tech company or a tech sort of centered company that has this kind of global footprint where you've sort of gone in and won in so many different countries around the world. There are always gaps, whichever other, com whichever other company you look mm -hmm. at. And so, I mean, like, you know, my, my, my question's simple. It's like, you know, what, what do you think was the confluence of factors that allowed Airbnb to actually dominate in these 220 countries that, that, you're, um, that you're in? I mean, it wasn't always certain to us that this would be as ubiquitous as it is today. I mean, uh, really, in 2009, for example, like 75% of the business was in New York. Um, and then, you know, very quickly, it spread throughout, I would say, the Western Hemisphere over the next couple of years. And there's this question, you know, will it work in Asia? Uh, and eventually it did. And then the question was, will it work in China? Yeah. And yes, it has. We have a big business in China. So it, it, it has been, um, we never assumed it would work everywhere. Although, you know, very early on, we realized the power of the model as well. And I think, you know, the realization is that, you know, people are, you know, fundamentally very similar um, in terms of, you know, what they value. Yeah. People all around the world want to travel and experience new things. Um, and people all around the world, you know, value the chance to, to meet new people and, and earn extra income. Um, and so those basics are true. I mean, I think we've seen a lot of things that differ too, but that's more in the product implementation versus kind of the core consumer behavior, um, at least, you know, in our sector of travel. Um, you know, certainly the global network effect has been, you know, very powerful. Yeah. Um, and we understood that, you know, very early on, some of the trends that we would see, you know, in the beginning, like I said, it was in New York. People from around the world want to come to New York. They were having good experiences. Then they were going back home to Paris, Berlin, wherever, and oftentimes the guests were becoming hosts. Mm -hmm. So there was this cross-pollination both globally, but also this conversion of, of demand into supply. Um, and so, you know, starting a two-sided marketplace is really hard, but when supply and demand can start to be interchangeable, yeah. that's actually very <clears throat> powerful, and when you have that global network effect. So, you know, that's what led to the, the, the glo global cross-pollination. You know, we also did a lot to understand, like, when does a market take off? When does it reach critical mass? When is it functioning well as a marketplace? And you know, we had early findings <clears throat> like, you know, when there's, once there's 300 properties and say 100 properties with reviews, that's when it becomes an interesting enough consumer experience that the conversion rate goes up. And so yeah, I think very early on, we started to model this um, quant and qu quantify it so that we could tell our story to investors um, yeah. and, and justify raising some of those big, big rounds early on. Um, yeah. yeah, and I, 
you know, one of the things that always struck me was that, um, you know, you, you sort of did that while preserving the, um, a, lo a lot of platforms grow by sort of bringing in bulk supply. And like, okay, like, you know, let's bring in sort of like, you know, traditional retailers on eBay to sort of like shore up supply, or let's bring in commercial lenders on a, you know, a peer-to-peer -peer lending platform. And you guys sort of went down this growth path while resisting sort of the temptation to sort of bring in like thousands of units sort of in bulk. And so it, yeah, it, it I, think, is I think it's been very important to us yeah. to continue to invest in a differentiated product. Um, and again, I don't think the product is actually even our website. Like the, the website facilitates everything, but the product yeah. is, you know, the host, the supply. And so, you know, we've been very... Um, aware that you know, as the size of the community grows, we want it to be diverse. We want it to offer different options. We don't want it to be all professional. That doesn't mean there can't be professionals, but we, we want to make sure that the core hosts, the, the small ones, are, are succeeding too. Um, uh, you know, another thing I think that's been super important to the growth is um, you know, really taking on more responsibility as a marketplace in order to um, you know, create the trust. I talked about some of the early innovations, but over time we've added things like the million dollar uh, host guarantee, which covers uh, property damage. We also have a separate insurance for uh, you know, any kind of uh, bodily harm. Um, we have a dedicated trust and safety team, 24 seven customer support and like, I yeah. don't know, 25 or, I don't even forget how many languages now, but a lot of languages. Um, and so you know, over time we've invested a lot into really taking responsibility um, for, you know, everything that's happening on the platform. And of course, you know, th that's an impossible feat, okay? I mean, it's, it's big. There's two to four million stays every night. Yeah. Um, you can't possibly control it. At the same time, um, you know, every one of those trips, our brand is on the line. And, you know, if you're going to be successful and grow to the scale, like, you have to know that when Airbnb is a noun and a verb, and if something goes wrong, you're gonna, you're gonna, everyone's gonna know about it. It's gonna be in the headlines, and it's gonna be a big story. And, and certainly there's been, there have been those stories. I'm sure you got, have seen them. Every one of those stories for us is, is a challenge, a challenge to um, invest more into the platform, and whether it's a safety issue, or a regulatory issue, or whatever it may be, thinking about, you know, how can we, how can we innovate further? How can we, how can we solve this um, going forward? Um, so it's, it's been an iterative process, yeah. uh, and, and we're still learning. Um, but I think, you know, over the span of 12 years, we've done a remarkable lot, and our, our, our kind of global success and leadership has, has been a result of, of, those yeah. kinds and, of and, and, that kind of mindset. And, and, and China seems sort of particularly striking as well, right? I know you've personally sort of led the growth of Airbnb in China, and, um, you know, there aren't too many examples of large tech companies that, have succeeded in China. There are plenty of examples of large tech companies that haven't. And so what's, what's, what's sort of the key to your success there? Well, you know, we saved China for, for last. Like we, we focused on Europe and then Asia and China for last because we knew China was gonna be so difficult. Everyone was telling us that. And you know, frankly, maybe it, it seems surprising in hindsight, but at the time we weren't sure if we should try China because everyone was saying, you're not gonna succeed. You're gonna spend a lot of years and a lot of money only to lose, so maybe you shouldn't try. Ultimately, we decided we have to try because our mission is to create a world where you can belong anywhere. And if 1.4 billion people live in China, like that's a really important part of the mission is to, to, to connect the world in that way. Um, but we had to have a strategy um, that we thought was credible. And so as part of that exercise, uh, we said, well, you know, what are the competitors good at? What are we good at? So we realized and quickly, agreed that the competitors will always be able to move faster uh, and be willing to spend more money than you. So if they can do that, what can you do that's going to cause you to you know, be successful? And so the, the thing in our business we identified was, well, outbound travel. The local companies don't have a global network. The local companies can't offer Chinese travelers to go abroad. Uh, they can only maybe build a network domestically, at least first, at first. However, on day one, we, we have that global network already in place. So why don't we expand into China and just solely focus on that? Let's not even try to do the domestic thing. Let's not even try to go head to head with any competitors. Just outbound travel. Just outbound travel. And so that was our approach and it would, took off very well and we were growing the outbound. Now we knew 
because we had done all this modeling before and seen how this progresses in other countries, that the Chinese travelers would go abroad, have good experiences, come home, and again, the guests would become hosts. And so organically, there'd be properties uh, appearing in China, um, and there'd be increasing awareness of what Airbnb is and what home sharing is, um, and a domestic market would eventually spring up, um, okay. even without a large-scale investment. And indeed, that's what's happened. And indeed, today, more than two-thirds of the nights booked by Chinese travelers are domestic, even though we spent a fraction of the money uh, relative to our competitors. Um, and so that's... Okay. That was our strategy. Yeah. I mean, there are uh, close to 100 questions that have come on online. This is, this is the problem when you lower transaction costs, right? I mean, um, but I've, I've got, like, you know, I, a, a few former students um, emailed me questions that they wanted to ask you earlier today. And so I've made a short list of three of them. So I'm going to ask you all three of them okay. at once. Uh, they're short questions. And then we'll sort of go to questions sure. from the audience that are physically present and... Uh, you know, we'll sort of a mix of the physical world and the digital, cool. right? I mean, and so the three questions that we sort of, uh, that, that my students sent you were, what's the one thing you'd have done different if you had to do it again? Um, what's the one key piece of advice for entrepreneurs out there? Like, you know, what's the one message you have for entrepreneurs who want to succeed? And uh, I mean, these are business school students after all, so their third question was like, you know, when are you guys going public? <laughs> <laughs> well, the third, the third one's very easy. I just, What's the insider scoop you can give us about the yeah, IPO? No, sorry. Like, on the third one, I can't share any insider <laughs> scoop. Uh, for, I have legal obligations around that, so I can't say too much, except to say that, as, as we've shared publicly, uh, in 2020, we will go public. We've said that publicly, and I'll confirm that today. Um, as to the other two questions, I guess um, something I wish we'd done differently I mean, this, this whole stakeholder framework, I think, um, I wish we had done sooner. I think it's super useful because, you know, over the course of the 12 years, I've certainly seen many examples where, you know, a team nested somewhere in the company is trying to maximize their goal. Let's say it's, you know, they're optimizing the search results and trying to maximize nights booked. But as they're doing that, they're not thinking about, you know, are they favoring some hosts over others? Um, are they thinking about uh, quality uh, and, and, and the you know, reviews that are being left and taking that into account? Are they thinking about the diversity of inventory they're showing in terms of um, price point? Um, there's actually a lot to think about when you're, particularly in a marketplace business, you can't optimize for, for one goal. It's very dangerous to optimize for one goal. Um, and yet, you know, teams, particularly engineers, you know, they really love to have that, like, real quantifiable goal and to, like, really knock it out of the park and, you know, use that as the justification for promotion. <laughs> um, and so I, I, th I think this stakeholder framework really communicates well to a large employee base. Like, look, these are things that are incredibly important to us, yeah. and we're all responsible for understanding our impact on these things. So, so there's that. I think the other question was around just kind of advice or tips. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's, there's lots of things I could say. I guess one big topic is, like, talent. Like, you know, it, it takes a village to build any company, um, you know, particularly a successful company. And, and so, you know, it might start with the founders, but very quickly it becomes about the team. And what I'd say about that is, um, you know, one thing we always would tell managers is, like, hire someone better than yourself. You always have to be up-leveling your talent. And you know, it's, it's somewhat of an unnatural thing for a couple of reasons. One, you know, typically managers want to be the smartest person, right? Like, um, and, and then two, you know, they might not know what talent looks like that's you know, better than themselves. They might yeah. not have seen it, frankly. So related to that, what we've often done is like learn from the best. So <clears> if you're trying to hire you know, a, a general counsel or a CFO or whatever, you know, think about you know, who are the famous CFOs uh, or whomever uh, that are out there and go meet with them and ask them, you know, what does a good CFO look like and do? Who do you know? Who knows? Maybe they're even interested. We, 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 we've been surprised that once you start talking to them um, about what you're doing, you can engage folks that you never thought you could engage. They would have never said they were interested in a job right off the bat. But once you build that relationship, you can actually start to reel some, some people in with some capabilities that you might have thought were out of reach. We had the saying uh, from the early days, just get them up the elevator. <laughs> so what we, our, our 
one of our tactics was just invite them over to lunch to tell them what we're up to. Not under the premise of that you're interviewing or that you might want a job. Just say, look, we'd love to learn from you. We'd love to show you our office. Do you want to come over? And I would say that most people would take us up on that offer. But once they were in the space and they saw the energy and they were learning about what we were doing, you could really start to reel people in uh, that you wouldn't otherwise get. And that's, you know, those are some strategies for how we've grown, grown the team, grown our talent, which I think is really important. As, you know, if you're in a hyper-growth company, you have to constantly um, be, be kind of up-leveling your own skills, but also the skills of the team. Yeah, that actually answers one of the questions that um, like, you know, came about sort of an early stage hiring, how do you hire people? Mm. Um, whoever asked this question also wanted to know, how do you know when they're a culture fit? Like, how, how, how do you sort of make that call early on? Well, a few different <clears throat> things. One, like, as I mentioned earlier, we were very um, deliberate and explicit about what we thought our culture was. Um, and so since the beginning, we, or since the very early days, we had, uh, once, in the very early days, the founders participated in all the interviews up until we had 400 employees. So that was one way to create consistency of culture. Um, and then once the founders weren't able to interview all day, uh, we created uh, what we called core value interviewers, specific people in the company that were trusted to have good judgment around the culture, good understanding of the culture. And so besides, you know, as an engineer interviewing for your technical interviews, you'd still go through two core value interviews that had nothing to do with, you know, tech or, or you know, being uh, in finance or whatever it, it, the function might be. Um, uh, so, so there was that. Um, you know, especially in the early days, we would spend time with folks outside of, um, outside of the interview process, uh, whether it was happy hour or we used to have recess back in the day. You know, you just do something socially to see how people behave. Um, we still do this at the executive level. Um, and you know, just get them outside of their context. Because you know, in an interview, people are oftentimes like on guard. They're trying to project a certain sense of self. We always f found that getting people in different environments was also a good way for them to, to get a sense for you know, who, who, what kind of person are they really. OK. We have a question from Troy asking, were there times early on where you and the team thought about giving up? And what were the reasons that you decided to push on? Um, there was only really one time where we almost gave up. And that was at the end of the first year, where we had been unsuccessful in raising any capital. And uh, the recession had just begun. This was the end of 2008. And it had been a year. And, and after trying for a year, you know, when do you know that it's just not a good idea and it's time to give up? And um, you know, there was three of us. And so no one of us really wanted to abandon the other two, because uh, we were all really dependent on one another. Um, and we agreed that we would give it 13 more weeks. And that over the 13 weeks, we would apply uh, to Y Combinator, which is a, an accelerator program. Yeah. Uh, only 13 weeks long. <clears throat> they give you a small, small amount of money. At least back then, now they give you more. Uh, and it culminated in a demo day. And we thought, OK, if we can get into this program, then we commit to each other that we'll give it 13 more weeks. And we'll be super serious and regimented. But at the end of the 13 weeks, if we are not in a materially better place, we all agree that it'll be time to quit. And it won't be an awkward conversation. Like, we'll pre-agree. And so that's, that was the agreement before entering into Y Combinator. And basically, for 13 weeks, we really hustled. Like, we lived together, woke up at 8, went to bed at midnight, worked all day, uh, six to seven days a week, only stopped to go to the gym or buy groceries or cook. Um, and you know, things really turned around during that period. So we never had to have that difficult conversation. But it really came down to that. I mean, we were basically 13 weeks away from walking away from it all. And oh. it was during that period that, you know, we got some, some advice that caused us to reflect about meeting our users, doing things that don't scale, coming to New York, photographing the properties. That really started the flywheel going um, and allowed us to show growth every single week. At the time, we had been making $200 a week for the last five months. And nothing we did moved that number. And so that's why we're in such a state of despair. And our goal over the 13 weeks was to get to $1,000 a week. And we ended up getting to $4,300 a week, and every week basically showing progress. Okay. And uh, we were then able to raise money and, and never have to have the awkward conversation. All right. I mean, there are 
There are literally over 100 questions okay. here. And I'll, I'm having, I'll try to keep my answer short. <clears throat> I'm, 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 I'm having trouble sorting oh, my popularity. Clock. Someone has complained that I'm not asking the most popular question. That I, I don't know how to work this into Tough things. questions. Find some tough questions. Yeah, I know. Well, but here's, here's, here's sort of a, um, a, a simple one, which has many votes from Sachin, which is, what's your go-to Airbnb when you visit New York City? And um, <laughs> are you staying there today? Yes, I'm staying at an Airbnb. I mean, I'd say every time it's a different Airbnb, just because you know you can't rely on getting the same one. Actually, most of my trips are to China over the last couple of years, uh, or to Asia. So I, I haven't been coming to New York that much, probably once a year. Um, although I expect a lot of trips this year. Okay. There's there's another question from Krishna, asking about like you know how do you how do you sort of keep control over the brand narrative when so much of the experience of a guest is uh, sort of relies on the host. Like how, how, how do you sort of maintain that brand narrative um, and keep it consistent? Well, I think a lot of the, what the brand stands for is unique, authentic experiences. And so in some ways that really promotes um, you know, a wide variety. I think what we're very cognizant of is um, not skewing it one way or another. I talked earlier about the search results and how there was a team that was optimizing for nights booked using machine learning. Yeah. And the result of the machine learning was like, everything was like $50 a night on the first page. I'm like, people are coming to me saying, I, I went to Airbnb, I didn't see anything that looked good to me. I was like, how could that be? And then I went to the first page and I started tapping through and it's like, everything was like the cheapest stuff possible. And I was like, wow, no wonder he couldn't find anything he wanted. Like, that, you know, he would probably want to pay 200 bucks a night. And all the first couple pages were just 50. And so, um, we have been much more thoughtful, uh, generally speaking, about making sure that we showcase um, all the different kinds of experiences you can have on Airbnb. So Airbnb is not just about one kind of thing. There's this you know, whole great diversity, which is what makes it special. OK. And I'm favoring the questions that are sort of a little more personal and a little less um, sort of generic Airbnb challenge issues. And so there's, there's another question, which is, this might be a difficult one, which is, uh, what, is someone th so what is something that you once valued that you no longer pay attention to? <laughs> well, I you, mean... You told me to bring on the tough question. Yeah, I mean, right? this, this is a uh, <laughs> practical thing. It's like the company has gotten so big that you just can't be in the details of everything. You have to learn to delegate and let go. And, you know, I was originally the only engineer and originally running the engineering team. And so I've had to let go of the tech side of things over time. Um, that was hard. Um, you know, particularly, uh, you know, there's certain things that uh, I would have liked to kept doing or, or had eyes on. But at some point, you have to let go and just say, um, you know, as a co-founder, I always ask myself, um, <clears throat> what is the intersection of what's most important for the company, and what can I do uniquely well? And that has meant over time that I do very different things. And so I had to pivot from you know, being the engineer and doing more technical things. I was able to hire for that um, to you know, kind of surprise challenges, like running China. Um, and now I'm getting a lot more involved in our public policy uh, stuff. Um, so you know, uh, that makes it also very interesting for me. Um, but that, that would, you know, be, be one of the things. Okay. And there's, so, so here's, um, you know, there are, there are some questions about um, sort of the responsibility of big tech companies more broadly. And so, you know, this is a challenging time for, for big tech. And, you know, there's a lot of public trust that we placed in tech companies. And now there's, um, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a time of pause, I guess, where we're sort of sitting and thinking what, what's next. So is there anything that you feel um, the big tech companies, um, not just Airbnb, but sort of like, you know, more broadly, I mean, what should they be, what, what are a couple of the important things that they need to do in the next few years to make sure that we sort of move down the right path? I, I think all tech companies need to lean into these challenges. I mean, you just, it's not sustainable to say that we're a platform and, you know, we can't solve this or someone else needs to solve this. Um, I think the intersection between tech and the real world is just so strong that, you know, people are demanding that, you know, I think tech companies play a bigger role in, in, in helping <clears throat> the right thing to happen. Now, I'm not saying tech companies alone should figure out what's the right thing to happen in place of government. Absolutely not. I think government 
um, ideally finds like what's the common denominator yeah. and, and defines that and, and, and sets those expectations. You know, on the other hand, you, you don't want government to over dictate the solution because that yeah. prevents all the innovation. So there is a balance there. I mean, I think ultimately, you know, the government has the final say. Most governments, at least our government, is elected by the people, so it's the best representation we have of what the people want, yeah. and, and and the government will 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 mandate that and has the power to do that, um, and so I think that's inevitable, and I think that's that's a good thing um, in the sense of serving the people and, and creating a level playing field. Uh, you know, on the other hand, look, the pendulum swings back and forth, and you know it's very easy to overcorrect, and so. Yeah. What I'd say is, yes, you know, uh, more regulation is inevitable and, and probably desirable. Um, on the other hand, you know, I would say, you know, be cautious, cautious and encourage tech companies to really lean into these challenges and, and start embracing them, um, even if historically uh, one might be of the mindset that that's not something they do. Um, you know, obviously, when it comes to, like, free speech and stuff, I know that's, like, super complicated topic. Yeah. Um, you know, but look, look at Airbnb and, and, you know, topics of, uh, you know, short-term rental law and enforcement and topics of af housing affordability. Yeah. You know, I think we, we've come to the place where uh, we're very committed to building the tools that allow government to effectively enforce the rules uh, that they ultimately decide upon. And of course, we have a viewpoint on like what those rules should be, but we recognize that it's not going to be one size fits all. That every every locality is going to come up with their own version of that, and that you know, in the long term, it's best for us um, to um, to make that work yeah. by providing the technology that's needed to make that work. Um, and what we found in places like San Francisco, where we did this relatively early on, I'll say two years ago. Um, is that you know once you get a stable regulatory framework in place, you know, the marketplace can resume growing again, and all can be well. And so there, there is oftentimes, there's definitely a period of adjustment where you take a hit. Yeah. Um, but that you know once there's a stable set of rules, you know life goes on, growth goes on, and 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 all stakeholders are are generally uh, happier or at least uh, better aligned. Yeah. I mean, so I think, you know, that that's, I think applies to everybody, but a little bit about our specific journey on this matter. Yeah. And, and it's complicated because, you know, de facto, a lot of things that, you know, traditionally you would go to the government to get to decide platforms sort of are forced to take on because yeah. there's a market failure, there's a problem that needs to be solved and you need to come up with a solution and you can't wait for the regulation to catch up. And so, I think that balance between platforms and governments and them sort of working synergistically. Uh, I'll give you one more just like, like really central, real example yeah. to make it super tangible. Like um, there's this issue of hotel tax, right? So most hotels, at least in North America, there's a, a hotel tax that applies. You know, anywhere from you know, 5 to 15% generally uh, at the local level. Um, so you know, very early on there's this question, like if you're renting out a room in your home, should that be, um, should that have to pay hotel tax or not? Is that like a hotel, more like a hotel, or is that more like, you know, not like a hotel? And so I think, you know, very early on, we decided that, look, um, you know, there is a case to be made that if you're doing this on a part-time basis and it's your extra bedroom, you should have to pay hotel tax. On the other hand, um, look, you're going to get a lot of pushback if, <clears> if you're kind of fighting what looks like a, an obligation and looks like something that's um, not in your best interest. So we, we embraced it early on. We, we made an open commitment around the globe to say that, Whatever the local hotel tax be, we're committed to playing by those same rules and creating the technology to effectively collect and remit it. Because again, it is the responsibility of the host to pay this tax. The reality is a lot of hosts are ordinary people, casual. They don't know how to do the tax paperwork. Um, they're not sophisticated enough to do that. But we platformatized it. And over the last few years, we've collected $2 billion in hotel tax that we've collected and remitted to local governments. Uh, it covers 75% of the US and we continue to grow it. Um, and so you know, these are the kinds of practical decisions where you, yeah. you, know, you could go one way or another. And I think we've often you know, had this stakeholder mindset of like, yeah. you know, let's, let's create value for all parties. Let's not try to say that we're somehow exempt from the rules yeah. just because we're a platform and technically the responsibility lies with the hosts. Yeah, but in many ways, you also need governments who will sort of open up their minds and realize that maybe some of what I used to do can now be done 
reliably by the platform and we can sort of give them the responsibility. Well, yeah, and, and in this case, like oftentimes we yeah. can't collect tax unless the government gives us permission to collect tax. Yeah. And so, you know, we've done this in so many places, but here in New York, you know, due to political reasons, uh, we have not been given the permission to collect the tax. And so $100 million goes uncollected every year because, mm -hmm. it, it, because of politics. Yeah. Well, so I'm going to end with one well, question. Keep it simple. I mean, we're, we're, <laughs> we're pretty much out of time, but there was a question that came online and offline. And it's a, uh, you know, it has, um, it's not Airbnb specific. And this is about like, you know, what are some books that have influenced you, sort of particularly, or like, are there any particular books that you've read that, um, you know, sort of had a, have had a big impact on your life? I know that there's this 500 page, <laughs> 500 -page programming, programming book, yeah, yes, <laughs> that, that you read when you were 12 years old, but yeah. Um, oh, geez, what's it called? Uh, Well, one book I really like around entrepreneurship and, and thinking about business ideas is, is Peter Thiel's Zero to One book. I think it's, it's, it's really good about you know, making sure that as an entrepreneur and you're identifying opportunities, you're not going to incrementalism um, and doing something slightly better that you, know, you really find ideas that are almost completely unbelievable in terms of like, will they work? Um, and certainly Airbnb is you know, one of those examples where everyone thought we were nuts. Um, and he talks about how those are some of the, ends up being some of the biggest companies. Um, so, you know, that, that, that one always resonated with me in terms of how to think about opportunities. Um, man, there's another one that I really have slipping in mind. It's like the five something of a team. Five. Five dysfunctions of a, of a, of a team, right? That's a great book. Um, you know, especially as we were growing the company. Um, you know, there was a lot of questions about how do you create that alignment, that shared, that, that trust, shared vision of success, accountability, um, and that, that book was a great template. Okay. Five well, of a team. Right. There are so many other questions on so many different topics. Um, we're going to have to have you. Fast. We're going we're to have to have you come back and do another one of these at some point. And yeah, uh, my pleasure. Thank you guys for coming out tonight and okay, being so well, interested in some of Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we, um, we, we, we do have a gift for you. Um, since uh, you're a successful tech entrepreneur, we bought you a hoodie. And so uh, we... It's good because this is not my usual uniform. Yeah, and so uh, this, is, uh, this is an NYU Stern hoodie for ah. you. Nice, thank you. And, I will uh, represent. <clears throat> yeah, and it's, uh, you know, Nate, it has been a real pleasure watching Airbnb grow over the last few years. I mean, I think, you know, you're, you're, you're one of the startups that really sort of creates a template for like, you know, what a responsible, successful startup should be. So I hope the next eight years are as good as the first, um, like, you know, 10 have been. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Arun. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.